It's lovely to be with you all um, and to be able to share this time in fellowship at uh, South Brisbane and I think also Bay Islands Church, is that right? And maybe some other friends from different places. Uh, some months ago, Pastor Gideon invited me to be at South Brisbane Church over this weekend, but of course that is not possible. And uh, so we are doing something a little bit more remote and it's lovely to be with you. Can you all hear me clearly? Is it okay? Is the sound yeah. coming through for you? Excellent, right? Um, and our theme for today, our theme for today is a very simple theme and a very interesting one. If you can eat, you can make disciples. As we said during the Sabbath school time, we've sometimes made evangelism very complicated and so we've left it mostly to the role of the pastor to give Bible studies. We have suggested if we go back and look at the story of Jesus, we will see a different approach. Something that anyone can do at no cost, it's reproducible and it's really fun. Um, here are some of our friends. When I published the first book that I wrote in 2017, our um, uh, Buddhist friends from next door, uh, they said, we'd like to come to the launch of your book. And so here are our Buddhist friends with us in an Adventist church on the opposite side of the city. And uh, our Buddhist neighbor was the first to receive the book, Following Jesus. We have a very close relationship with these friends and we re read the Bible and we pray and we eat. Even during these COVID times when in Melbourne we cannot go to people's homes and they cannot come to our home, uh, we talk to each other, we pray with them on FaceTime or on the phone and, uh, and we share together. How do we make these types of contacts and how can we share with people like this? Now, here is another friend, uh, Nisa, and her husband, Izzy. They're a Muslim family. And uh, twice, Anissa rang us yesterday and had the opportunity of praying with her um, about some decisions that they're making at the present time. So how do we connect with neighbours, with friends? Uh, what is the story that Jesus shared and what instruction has Jesus given to us? So I've written a little book called If You Can Eat, You Can Make Disciples. And just during the last couple of weeks, another little book has come out called If You Are Thirsty, You Can Be Spirit Filled. But we're going to focus on the main theme of this subject, If You Can Eat. Now, as I look around the screens, um, I sense that some of you enjoy eating very much. Um, and we all enjoy eating. If you can eat, you can make disciples. That's the message of Jesus. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. This is a very famous statement from Ellen White's writings in Ministry of Healing. It's probably a statement that you know. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. And Ellen White describes that method a little bit. Um, but, you know, sometimes I think, I think sometimes that we as a church will do anything and spend any amount of money as long as we don't have to follow the method of Jesus. And yet the method of Jesus is simple, reproducible, anyone can do it, and it costs nothing. You don't need to spend any money. You do need to spend a little bit of time. But we're going to look at this method of Jesus and we're going to read this method carefully. I think that you will really appreciate the simplicity and the excitement of this approach. You can use it with your family. You can use it with neighbours. You can use it with work associates. It's not a situation where you're going to be telling people all that you think that you know. You can use this with university professors. You can use it with uneducated people. You can use this with the average person. You can use it with 
the prime minister of the country. I have used this method with two prime ministers of different countries over the last couple of years. The method that Jesus gave to us in Luke chapter 10. And I'm sure that when we've finished our worship time today, most of you will say, I can do that. Because it's very, very simple. Now, when we look at the life story of Jesus, we see Jesus um, actually modelling, uh, making disciples. He came into this world to establish his father's kingdom. And in making disciples, we are inviting people to become part of the kingdom of God where people grow in their discipleship, that means in their journey, their relationship with Jesus, and also where they grow in, in the very uh, great opportunity of sharing faith, which we have called evangelism, but that word has become a little bit specialist, or we can call it disciple making. That was the word, the term that Jesus actually used in the Great Commission. By his life, by his teaching and by his commission, Jesus has shown us his method. We don't have time, but Jesus used only five invitations to make disciples. He said, come and see, follow me, fish with me, sacrifice with me, and receive the Holy Spirit. Those were the five invitations that Jesus used in making disciples. But then we find him actually teaching the 12. Jesus called the 12 apostles two years into his ministry. Some people don't realize as they read the Gospels that Jesus did not preach the Sermon on the Mount at the beginning of his ministry. Jesus did not call the 12 at the beginning of his ministry. He called the 12 and preached the Sermon on the Mount two years into his ministry. Right? And then when he had... 12, he trained them and he gave them training into how to grow spiritually and he gave them training into how to make disciples. Then six months before Jesus died, Jesus trained another group. We read about this in Luke chapter 10. And the whole training that he gave as he sent out the 70 or the 72, depending upon which translation you have, the whole training that he gave is between verses 1 to 24. So this is Jesus' training. I reckon that's a good place to start. If we want to know how to share faith, if we want to know how to uh, connect with people in our no-faith and multi-faith world, I would suggest Jesus' method is the best method. He's the one who came into this world and on Resurrection Sunday evening, he said, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So we're going to look at this method that Jesus shared and I think you'll find enormous blessing in applying the teaching of Jesus. Now, we really don't have time uh, because I'm not going to talk all day and I'm not going to even talk the whole time, but we don't have time to look at the whole scripture. We should read Luke 10, 1 to 24. I want you to do that this afternoon. Read the whole story, verses 1 to 24, so you see it in context, right? But we're going to look in particular at verses 1 to 9. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the Discovery Bible Reading Method to unpack this scripture. You got your Bibles open or your iPads or your pads, your tablets, your phones, and you've got them open to Luke chapter 10, and you can have whatever translation you like, including Tok Pisin or uh, Hirimotu or Greek or Farsi or uh, English or whatever translation, that's okay. But when we speak, we'll just stay with the uh, the English today, whichever translation you have. Now, in Discovery Bible Reading, we read the story once, then we read it a second time, then someone tells a story, then we start discussing it, right? So Luke chapter 10, and we're just going to start the first part of Jesus' teaching or training here, and we're going to look at this together. Luke chapter 10. So this is our scripture reading for the day, okay? 
After this, the Lord appointed 72 others. Now, let me ask, how many of you have a Bible that says 70 others? Let me see your hand or put a hand signal up. How many of you have a Bible that says 70 others, right? We see one. Any others with 70? Yes. Okay, another one. Some have 72. Some have 70. Just some little bit of background. If you have 70, it means you have an older translation based on more recent manuscripts. If your Bible says 72, you have a newer translation based on much, much older manuscripts. At the present time, I'm writing a little book, and Rhonda, this is, I've been to Porgara. I conducted a baptism in the river in Porgara, and it's freezing cold, Rhonda. I tell you, they're out in those areas. Yes, yeah, correct. Um, <laughs> it's very cold. <laughs> very cold conducting a baptism in the river out there, right? Um, I'm writing a little book at the moment, I think it will be of interest to everybody, but it's about how the Bible was inspired, who chose the books of the Bible, um, and, and how the manuscripts were preserved and given to us. I'm writing it in particular for people in Papua New Guinea, but I think it will be of interest to everybody, right? So if you have a Bible that says 70 others, it means it's an older translation but the manuscripts that it's based on are much more recent, only a 1,000 years old. If you have 72, it's a newer translation based on manuscripts of the Bible from just after the time of Jesus, so a 1,000 years older than the other ones. But it doesn't change the meaning, does it? It doesn't change the meaning, and we can use different translations, and it doesn't change the meaning. So let me read, and because we have some who have Bible translations that say 70 and some that say 72. I'm going to mix it up a bit, okay? After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. Now, remember, this is Jesus talking to us. Jesus is teaching us in this, in this scripture, okay? Then he says, when you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If a person of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. Again, I remember Jesus is teaching us. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is set before you, heal the sick who are there, and tell them the kingdom of God is near you now. Right? Now, that's the, that's the scripture that we're reading today during our worship service, Luke 10, 1 to 9. Who else would like to read this scripture? Want another person to read it? Luke 10, 1 to 9. I'll, I'll have the New King James Version. That's good. Thank you very much. Yes, so after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also, and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Then he said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Carry neither money bag, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the road. But whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you and remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the labourer is worthy of his wages. 
Do not go from house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you and heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, who would like to um, tell that story? Just say, this is what I remember from the story. Who would like to do that in a couple of sentences? Jesus chose more than 70 or 70 people. He sent them to the villages which they possibly know or they don't know. Yes. And he asked them to greet them uh, with a message of hope and to stay at that particular place till they find another place to go to or they might have other disciples to make. Right. Okay. Thank you very much, Kafar. That's, that's a, a good little summary. Who would like to add to that summary? Some other things that stood out for you. That's very good. Jesus was sending them to where he himself was going to go. Okay. He sent them to where he's going to go. Now, if we read the context, we'll see that he was about to go to Jerusalem and then he was about to go into the edge of Samaria and he was going to spend three months across in a pagan place called Perea. Okay, yeah, that's good. Another thing that you think that you'd like to add as you've read this story. You're just seeing the main features of the story. He implied that there was something a little bit, um, perhaps dangerous about it, uh, okay. uh, that they would be uh, lambs among wolves. Yes, yes. Something else that you see in the story. I am, um, <clears throat> here, I see that like, there's sort of no mention around actually preaching the gospel it, it sounds it sounds like about establishing relationships and actually creating that as the foundation to to preach or to share the gospel okay we're starting to unpack it now so we can come to our main main questions that we ask what is new what surprised us what do we not understand and and you're right there's plenty of the, some things that are in this story now you don't actually have the gospel, although he says, tell them, he says, eat their food, whatever they give you, heal them, and then tell them about the kingdom of God that is at hand or the kingdom of God near you now. Now, when Jesus introduced his message, he called the good news. He said, it's the kingdom. The good news is about the kingdom of God. So it is the gospel. Good, good, good question. Good point. Yeah. Another, another insight that you get. What surprises you in the story? You see, he encourages us, don't go from house to house, just stay in the one house. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. Don't don't keep moving around. Eat what you've been given to eat and drink. Yes, okay. So there's a big focus on uh, eating the food that the people give you. Uh, Pastor, coming from the culture, uh, Hospitality normally, when you have a guest, it go for after maybe said maybe after a week, you no longer give them the food of a guest. So the top of the food which you've been giving first and second day, is not the same after eight or nine days, which will indicate maybe those people they will not be given the food and they won't be ha uh, happy. Say so we not go to the neighbor and they have that treatment of a special person, and that's why Jesus said, look stick where you're going because the treatment which you're going to get is what you deserve. Okay, right. Yeah, that's interesting. In every culture, in every single culture, and I have taught pastors in over 100 countries and worked in many countries planting churches, in every single culture, food is part of culture. Is that true? It's a very important part of the culture of the Philippines. It's a very important part of the culture of Papua New Guinea. It's a very important part of the culture of the Middle East. It's a very important part of the culture of all of the Pacific. It's a very important part of every culture. In our culture, we have 
in Aussie culture, whether you have a Filipino background or a Samoan background or a, a Iraqi background, we have a we have a saying. If we want to catch up with each other, what do we say? For a meal. Let's have a feed. Yeah, yeah. You know, they put it into Aussie terms. We say, shall we have a coffee? We'll see you at Macca's. Yes, we'll see you at Macca's. <laughs> okay. Uh, seeing you at Macca's doesn't say what you're going to eat. When you say, let's catch up and have a coffee together, you're not actually saying you're going to drink coffee. You might even drink water. Mm. But it's, a, it's a, a very important part of culture. It's a connecting point. It's a connecting uh, language that we use. And Jesus is, is highlighting that. What else do you find in this story that is new or surprises you? One, you said, don't move around from house to house. What else? Um, one thing that jumps out at me is, um, you know, so much financial insecurity and um, uncertainty at the moment. It yeah. is a bit more of a concern for us about our financial well-being. Um, but you've noticed here, number four, it's like Jesus is saying, you don't need to worry about a financial plan. Um, you don't need to have a, a, a belt or special investment plans. It's, I've got you. Yeah, don't, and don't, you don't need to carry a whole lot of stuff, right? Now, often in our forms of evangelism or witness, we carry a whole lot of baggage. We carry a whole lot of stuff. Uh, we carry uh, books or um, videos or DVDs or Bible cards or we carry a whole lot of stuff. And, and Jesus said, don't carry purses or bags or extra stuff. Go and meet the people. And if they welcome you, now, what language, what, what words did they say when in Jesus' time? What was the word that they used? In, in, in a Jewish culture, what was the word that they used when they said hello? Was it peace be on to Shalom. Yeah, shalom. shalom. Be on you. Right? Shalom. Um, Shabbat shalom. Uh, it, it did not mean happy Sabbath. Shabbat shalom does not mean happy Sabbath. Peace. It means may God's grace and peace be upon you, even if you're not having a happy day. Right? Um, it's a far richer term. Do we have any Fijians with us? Uh, the term bulla is a, a richer term than just hello or good day or how are you or good morning, right? Now, what is, what is the term in Arabic? Uh, salam. 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 And that's the same as the word shalom, right? It means peace or God's blessing upon you. It's a rich term, isn't it, Kafar? Mm. Very rich term, right? And Jesus is saying, when you say the words, hello, how are you today? Be aware. If you keep reading the story, verse 16, he who listens to you listens to me. He who rejects you rejects me. But he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. My brothers and sisters, you do not live in your community, in your house or your community, or in the school where you teach, or in the office where you work, or the building site where you, where you work, you do not live or work there just as a person on your own. The Holy Spirit lives in you as a believer. You understand? Amen. When you say good morning to somebody, watch to see what response. Listen carefully, because maybe their response will indicate that they're starting to receive the Holy Spirit who is in you. Being involved in sharing faith is one of the most exciting things. Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, and he was born of the Holy Spirit, he was baptized by the Holy Spirit, he was full of the Holy Spirit, so I send you. And our baptism was our anointing for the service of making disciples. Just like Jesus was baptized with the Holy Spirit, we are filled and the Holy Spirit lives in us. And so whether it's in that staff room or it's at the nurse station, we are the presence of Jesus. 
And Jesus says, when people receive you, right, they might be receiving me. And so Jesus is highlighting some really important things. When you are welcomed, we're not going to say shalom and we're not going to say salam to people unless we're talking to Jews or we're talking to Arabic-speaking people, right? But we'll say hello, good morning, how are you? And when we see the response, we can see, is this person a key person? Now, you notice Jesus said, you're looking for a key person. He calls that person in verse 5, what? No, verse 6. If a person or a man of peace is there, this person is a key person. He says, if you find a key person, then you stay. Now, you think of the key people that Jesus reached. When he reached the first disciples of John the Baptist, they followed him, two of them. He came back from the wilderness, John chapter 1, and they're following him. And they ask, where are you staying at Bethany beyond Jordan? And Jesus said, come and see. Come and see. Very simple invitation. And then Jesus spent time with them. They would have eaten olives and maybe some grapes and some dried grapes, and they would have drunk some water uh, in the heat of the um, Jordan Desert Valley. And, and Jesus and is talking with them. And when they leave, Andrew goes to find Peter and Philip goes to find Nat and Nathaniel. And they say, come and see, we have found the Messiah, the one that Moses and the prophets spoke about. Come and see. And the same with the woman at the well. There was a key person. Jesus had to go through Samaria, we read in John chapter 4. He goes through Samaria, sits at the well. His male disciples go into town to buy some food. He's not focused on that. A woman comes, a broken woman. It doesn't say that she was a sinful woman. It says she was a broken woman. She'd been married five times. And Jesus talks to her. And when she said, Jesus, give me this water that you have so that I will never thirst, he says, go and call your husband. So he's drinking some water. He's drinking her drink. He's eating her food. He's drinking, I have food to eat that you don't know of, he told his male disciples. It's not about how much food we're eating. Rather, it's that hospitality and he's connecting and he's found a key person. And when she went back to the village, she brought the whole village to Jesus. That's why Jesus says, don't run around. Look for that key person, right? That's what he's saying in this. Look for that key person. And, and when you're looking for that key person, you keep in mind these simple steps. He says, eat, eat. Now, I want you to look at these steps because this is really important. Um, let's, let's just summarize what we've seen so far in this little discussion that we've had. And, uh, I want you to see, uh, first thing, he put them into little teams. You notice that? The first thing he did, it says there were 70, he pointed 70 or 72 others, and he sent them two by two. He put them into little teams. Now, you can look at your teams in different ways. But Judy, my wife and I, we are a team in our neighbourhood. We connect with people as a team. They know that Judy is my wife. They know that I am Judy's husband. And we are like a team in our community, right, to represent God. Um, you might team up with a friend. You might team up, team up with a child. You might team, team up with a husband or a wife, a spouse or a friend, um, someone else from your church, um, but you form a team. Why is it important that we share in teams? Well, you see, the basic unit, this might shock you, but the basic unit of the Christian church is not the individual believer. When Jesus talked about church and he only spoke about church in Matthew 16 and Matthew 18, he spoke of the two or three who gather in his name as the church. The two or three who gather in his name. So when he sent disciples to make disciples, 
He sent them in teams of two or three, sometimes four. And when people became believers in Jesus and they formed a gathering, that's what the mean ch word church means, they formed a gathering, he spoke of the two or three gathered in his name. Because, you see, God is community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when we go to share faith, whether it be in our own house or whether it be with our neighbours or whether it be in our workplace, when we share faith, we are representing God. And when people come to Jesus and we form a church, a gathering, the two or three gathered in the name of Jesus, then we have the body of Jesus and we're representing God. So the team idea is very important. It also encourages us and, and, and we get that support as we go. Then Jesus said, and I think was it Andrew, you highlighted, he, he talked about the places where they were going to go. So we think intentionally about where we're going to go. Then he mentioned prayer. And did you notice it's a very particular, a very particular prayer. Did you see that? Look at uh, Luke chapter 10 and verse 2. He doesn't say pray for protection against the dogs, uh, pray for protection because I'm sending a sheep amongst wolves, uh, pray that you'll know what to say. He, he doesn't say that. What does he say? What does he say to pray for? The harvest and the labour. Yes. He says, I want you to see. There's a lot of people waiting to know me. Now, often we look at a, a suburb or a city or a country and we say, it's very, very difficult here. As I said, I've been ministered in over 100 countries. And people will tell me in Iceland, it's very different, difficult. And people will tell me in Israel, it's very difficult. And people will tell me in Egypt, it's very difficult. And people will tell me in Iraq, it's very difficult. And people will tell me, this is the most difficult place. We need to get new eyes. Yes, Australia is difficult. But Jesus says the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So the prayer is, pray the Lord of the harvest for more harvesters. I would suggest in your weekly prayers and in your daily prayers, pray for more harvesters. The General Conference has suggested we have a special prayer called the 1002 prayer. So at, 10, at two minutes past 10 every morning, we set our phones to buzz and they buzz and they remind us, 1002, okay, I need to pray for more harvesters in the place where I live. I need to pray for more harvesters where I can share faith with people. More harvesters for the harvest field. So it changes our attitude towards our community. It changes our attitude towards our neighbours. And God is leading us to know about more harvesters and he will bring more people to us. That is really important for us to, us to connect with people. Okay? So that's the third step. He says, number one, think about teams. Number two, be intentional. Is it going to be with our children? Are we going to share with our neighbours? I say start in the easiest place. You don't have to go down the street and start knocking on doors. Start where it's easiest. You know, every week I have many conferences like this with pastors and with churches around the world on Zoom. The other day I was having a meeting with about 25, 30, Peter, put your microphone on, please. Put it on. Maybe someone unmuted muted me. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Can now. Yes. 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 I was talking to a group of 20, 30 pastors, and I asked them, how many of you pastors have people living in your homes who are not believers? I ask you. How many of you as believers have people living in your homes who are not believers? Those pastors, we counted, there were at least 45 people living in their houses who were not believers. 
So why are we running down the street to knock on doors when we could share with the people who live right where we are? And since COVID has hit, we were all forced to go home and to do church at home. We were forced to go home and what an opportunity to share faith with our families. Jesus said, find key people. And then I want you to notice, he said, number one, eat their food. Number two, heal them. Number three, share with them, the kingdom of heaven is near to you now. Now, these are the three steps that go from, these are critically significant steps. These are the three steps that move from contact to actually sharing faith. Did you see those three steps? Have you memorized them? Verses eight and nine. When you enter a town or enter a place or enter your home or enter your workplace and you're welcomed, eat. Eat their food. It doesn't say cook food for them. It says eat their food. Right? Number two, heal the sick. Now that tells me about step number one. Because if you're going to heal people, if you're going to meet their needs, you need to know what those needs are. So I suggest it's number one, eat their food and listen. Now, I'm not sure about you, but my mother taught me, put food in your mouth, and when you put the food in your mouth, shut your mouth. Did your mother teach you that? Put the food in your mouth, close your mouth. And when a neighbour or a friend gives you a biscuit, piece of banana, piece of bread, hot drink, drink of water, as you go to put that in your mouth, you say, tell me, tell me about life. How is it for you? Now, friends, you already know them. They're going to be telling you a lot of stories. Listen, listen. Put something in your mouth and listen. Eat their food and listen. And as you listen, you will hear, you will hear the stories that they have to share. And as they share the stories, you will hear what their need is. And that's where you know what to encourage them about. That's healing. You will know what to give them some advice about. That's healing. You will know what to pray with them about. That is healing. The sickness might be a mental, social, physical, um, relational, um, spiritual, any of those that people need healing for. And so never be afraid to say, I could pray for you. And that's where we share our story. In about one minute, two minutes, I was brought up in a Christian home because there was no school and there was no money there, I had to leave home when I was 15. I never lived at home again after I was 15. I worked, got my way through school. And when I was 16, I had to make the decision, am I going to follow the God that my parents had taught me about? And I decided to follow him. And you know what I've learnt? You know what I've learnt, Kafar? God is with me through the good times and the bad times. I'm into that. And he's interested in you too. That's my story. That's my testimony. And that's now a bridge because you can trust the God that I believe in. So eat their food, listen. They tell you their problems, heal them. I could pray for you. Pray for them. Tell them your story. Introduce God's story. Number three. So you move from that general discussion, the visit, meeting needs, you move just simply into the next area of sharing faith. You notice these three steps again? Eat their food and listen to their story. Heal them and share your story. Then share the kingdom of God is near. God is interested in you. And so we move, we move to where we can introduce the story of Jesus very simply. And this is where we share Discovery Bible. Read. Would you like to read? Would you like to read about Jesus? Would you like to know a little bit more about him? I can give to you 
a copy of the Gospel of Mark, or you can download it onto your phone. We usually start with the Gospel of Mark because it's the simplest gospel. It introduces the story of Jesus. Now, most of our friends, most of our neighbours, most of the people we mix with don't know any stories of Jesus. Is that true? Most do not know any stories about Jesus and they don't know where to start. I was at a church before COVID, preached at a church in Melbourne. During the fellowship lunch, uh, they said, could you come and talk to these three young ladies? They've been coming to church now for a few weeks and they're reading the Bible because they want to know about Jesus. So I went and sat with them, three young ladies attending an Adventist church. They wanted to learn about Jesus. And they said, we've been reading the Bible because someone said we could read the Bible and learn about Jesus. But they said, we haven't found anything in the Bible about Jesus. I said, where did you start? They said, we started at the beginning. So we started Genesis. I said, where are you up to? They said, we got to Deuteronomy or something like that. I said, wow, you need a medal. You need a certificate. To get that far, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they're trying to read about Jesus. They haven't found anything about Jesus yet. I said to them, you've got another 800 pages to go before you'll read anything about Jesus. Now, are those books of the Bible valuable and good? Yes, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. But if you want people to know about Jesus, Guide them to read one of the Gospels. And the Gospel of Mark is a great place to start. That's why the division has printed half a million of these free for all church members to give to their neighbours and friends and to introduce them to Jesus so they can read the stories of Jesus in Mark and John and the book of Acts, right? You should be getting these. They've been shipped out through the Australian Union. There is a box full at least for every pastor. And so, Pastor Gideon, make sure you get your quota and give them to people so they can share them with friends and introduce people to reading the story of Jesus. Many people don't know anything about Jesus. They do not know when he lived. They do not know that he died. They do not know that he rose from the grave. They know nothing about Jesus. So that's why we go eat their food, listen, 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 and then we heal them. And so we say to our Muslim friends, we say to our Buddhist friends, we say to our Sikh friends, we say to our atheist friends who we meet in their homes when they invite us to sit and have a coffee. We don't drink coffee. We can drink water. We can drink whatever. You don't have to eat everything on the table. You choose a little and you, cho you don't make a fuss about it. You just choose what you can eat. Judy is gluten intolerant. We don't say to people, oh, Judy is gluten intolerant. We just go to the home and then she chooses from the table one or two things that she can eat. And we listen and listen. And then we say, now we could pray for you. Would you like us to pray for you? And every time we find people say, thank you. And we pray a very simple prayer. We usually keep our eyes open. Dear God, thank you that we can be here with our friends and they have a special need and we're asking for your care and your blessing for them. And we pray specifically. Only very short in normal language so that people can experience God. This is so important. And then we can introduce Discovery Bible reading and the idea of reading through the Gospel of Mark. Would you like to do that? We just do it together. So you're not coming as the expert and you're going to give them all the teaching. You're just going to share with them simply. So let me share with you a story. This is a cross-cultural story. Those of you from Papua New Guinea will love this. We're in Port Moresby. But you will see the principles of how this idea, this simple idea can be used anywhere. Okay, let's look at this story.
I'm Lee Rice, leader of discipleship ministries for the South Pacific. I'm in Port Moresby today and excited to be with Pastor Kobe Tao, leader of the church in this city of 800,000 people. Discovery Bible reading is at the heart of our disciple making process. Members invite family, friends, work colleagues, fellow students to come together to read the Bible. We asked Peter Rumfeld to come and do some training for us. Peter has taught us the method of Jesus, which is simple. Anybody can do it. It's reproducible at no cost. We decided to restructure the way we do ministry of the churches. And we followed the model in the book of Acts, uh, how the New Testament church grew. We turn our Sabbath school classes into discovery Bible reading groups. We've restructured our church Sabbath school classes according to the place where the members are living. We bring the church to the houses and the houses become church. My name is Nathan. I got excited uh, seeing the method in which we can share God's word to others. And I had a bad idea and decided that I had to bring that idea to my home. Now this is where we meet every Sabbath. When we started this discovery Bible with my family and my neighbors, it really had a big impact on our spiritual life. My family and uh, my kids, uh, all the three teenagers, uh, were able to discuss the Bible for themselves, and we were having fun with it. Starting with the Gospel of Mark, read one story at a time, commencing with the prayer, obviously. Second person reads it, and then one person in the group retells the story in their own words. The process is built around five simple questions. What is new? What surprises? What don't you understand? What will you obey or apply to your life? And what will you share with someone else this week? After the discussion, we pray. Father, thank you for being with us. Please help us as we follow Jesus this week. I work for a large construction company as a building supervisor. After running that group in my home, I decided to bring that idea to my workplace. It had a very big impact on uh, my boys. I know an old blind man called Benike. I found out he lived in a makeshift sort of house. I had this idea of building a house. I went and discussed that with my boys. They got excited and they voluntarily put their hand up to help me. I believe Jesus my stay here. I trust in him. One day he returned, I go with him. Every Sabbath there is two or three baptism in each churches. By way of record this quarter, this has been the biggest baptism ever taken place in Central Park Conference. Uh, I am seeing a paradigm shift in the way we do church because the church is now seeing that we have to bring the church to where the community is. God uses ordinary people to carry out his extraordinary plan. I hope you've been encouraged and inspired by the simplicity of Jesus' method. The simplicity. Um, Nathan, Nathan, that man in that video, none of that was scripted. That was simply pictures taken uh, on site as they were sharing. Nathan um, had only been in the church for 12 months. He was very much a backslider, um, violent and drunk, 
and he became a believer. Then he learned from his pastor, Pastor Frank, uh, how to share the Bible with his friends. Uh, the leading elder became his coach, um, and Nathan started sharing with his family, with his neighbours, and the people just started to come into that environment. Then he took it to his workplace, not during work time. He does that every morning of the week, Monday to Friday, for 15 minutes before work starts. And he shared Discovery Bible reading there. Uh, this is a very simple journey. Jesus said, eat. Eat, listen, listen. Don't come with your agenda. Don't come with your message. Don't come with what you're going to tell people. Eat and listen. Heal their brokenness. Give them encouragement. Sometimes you'll need to encourage them to go and see their doctor, um, but you encourage and you pray with them. Simple prayer directly about their needs. And through that, you introduce God's story. God cares about you. Would you like to know a little more about Jesus? The best way to know about Jesus is to read a couple of the books that were written just after Jesus' time by people who followed him. This is a book that is 2,000 years old from the time of Jesus, just 20 pages, 21 pages long. And we could read it using Discovery Bible Reading and you'll come to know Jesus. And as you read that story with people, the story of Jesus will convict and people will understand the gospel and the kingdom of God. And you go on through the gospel of John. We don't have time to describe it all. Go through the gospel of John. All the fundamental teachings of the Adventist church except one are found in the gospel of John. Only the story of the 1,000 years or the millennium. That's the only doctrine you don't find in the Gospel of John. All the other doctrines are there, some in full form, some in a summary form. So that's why we put Mark and John into this little binding. And the book of Acts helps people understand how to gather new groups of faith and to share faith with each other. It's been a rich experience to be with you, but I want to challenge you. Don't leave church today simply saying, well, that was interesting. Have you decided where you're going to start? Have you decided where you're going to start? Otherwise, I've wasted my time and you've wasted your time. It's also a question of where will you start? With your children? With your spouse? With a partner? with a neighbour, with a work colleague. God has placed you as a believer in your community. Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. The Holy Spirit, your baptism was not just in water. Your baptism was your ordination. It was your ordination. The only ordination spoken of in the New Testament was your baptism. Your baptism was your ordination for disciple-making, your ordination to your ministry of disciple-making. I challenge you, think, where will I start? So you may want to spend some time talking as a community of believers uh, in your Zoom chat about where you might start. And, and then it's simple. Anyone can do it. You don't have to know anything. You just start reading the Bible with a friend using those five questions. And if someone asks a question you don't have an answer to, you say, I don't know. Let's keep reading. Simple. I don't know. Let's keep reading. And you grow together. The Holy Spirit will lead you. Pastor Gideon, great pleasure to be with you for this Sabbath. And, and I hand over to you and to Kafar and to your leaders to bring this time of worship to a close. Um, yeah, I just want to offer a word of thank you, um, Peter. I know that your schedule and your responsibilities would mean that um, you've got a lot of different things on your plate that you're juggling. Um, but we do really thank you for giving your time to share with us the word this, this morning. Um, and I, I believe that this is meat in season. 
Um, I believe that the Spirit's given you a message, and it's a message that uh, many of our um, our members are ready to run with. Um, right. I really believe that the Holy Spirit has been preparing hearts, um, mm-hmm. and and the paradigm is changing, and times are changing as well, and we really need to see what we can do uh, or see what the Spirit can do through us uh, to reach those that are in the community. Um, yeah. So we do really thank you. Um, thank you for sharing. Uh, you'll have to sh- thank your wife as well. I think the initial plan was for you to fly up and then you were going to come with your wife as well and it was going to be a nice weekend. And you might have even gotten to see some goldy, golden um, uh, coast, Gold Coast. Um, but that's all changed. But we do still thank you that you've been able to pass that on. And, and I think I, I share this message on behalf of the whole church, thank Peter, and, and we, we pray that um, God will bless your ministry abundantly um, and continue to do that. And we, I just want to prom- I just want to put out there as well to our members that I'm going to be looking at some of those resources. Um, and if anyone is really keen to get those straight away, then I'll get onto that um, ASAP and be able to hopefully resource all of you um, in your own sphere. Yes. Um, there has been some good news stories. Like I can probably say we've got Sam on board here. We've got Jan and Eloise, um, Kafar, Maureen, um, Ruth. We've, these are some of the ones who God's opened the opportunity for them to share as well. So I just want to encourage all of those people that I mentioned and others that God can use anyone. That's right. Um, so yeah, thank you for making it simple and really powerful stuff, Peter. Um, so I think, yeah, I just want to say word. Yeah, uh, Pastor Peter, I, we already started receiving some uh, messages. Your time and our time has not been wasted. So praise, praise the Lord that you have already have a few disciples willing to follow what you ask. Right. God bless you. God bless yeah. you. Wonderful message. Mm. Simple and practical. Yes. Thank you. Great to see you, Matthew. Would you like to say prayer, closing prayer, Peter? Our gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to share together this Sabbath day. We thank you, Jesus, that we can look to you for salvation. And we thank you that you've given to us the privilege of inviting others to you. Thank you for the simplicity of your method, your approach. Mm. I pray for the anointing of your Holy Spirit every day, the refilling of your presence, Holy Spirit, to make us powerful and effective in talking about Jesus. Bless each person gathered today. Bless as we go to share your grace and your love with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Mm.